Good afternoon from Vienna. A warm welcome to all our participants from the side of VU Vienna and our today's speakers team. My name is Barbara. I'm working at the Institute for Managing Sustainability at Vienna University of Economics and Business. And together with the head of our institute, André, we will host this webinar today and we will guide you through this webinar session. You think that playing is childish? You think that gaming te technology is too complex? Or you think that there are no games that fit to your curriculum? Let us change your mind. Since COVID-19 hit our world, distance teaching and home learning became the new normal in higher education. Since spring this year, we provide an expert forum for sharing insights, exchange of experiences, and exchange of best practices and knowledge transfer. It's all within the EU-funded project Living Innovation. Our goals, exchange of experiences, acceleration of everyone's learning curve, and also the co-creation of the smart university of the future. We conducted two, um, I think, very successful webinars this spring, um, where we facilitated the knowledge transfer in experience-based learning and in humor in distance teaching. There were um, more than 100 people participating, and we are very happy to continue this webinar series today. Before Andre will introduce today's speakers, let me say some rules for today. Next slide, please. Please use the chat function for questions anytime. Please mute yourself unless you speak. And please switch on your camera if the moderator if I address you specifically. I also want to point out that we will record this webinar. So if you want to participate, but you don't want to be seen, please switch off your camera. If you want to participate and you have an issue with the recording in general, please contact me via the private chat and we will edit the post, edit the webinar in the post-production respectively. Before we jump into the topic, next slide please, I have an introductory question. We want you to write into the chat box what you're interested in by typing two things. Are you here to share or are you here to learn? And one sentence, please, on what you want to share or learn. So please take the chance, put into the chat, and let us know about your... A lot of participants want to learn, but also some expert that would like, experts that would like to share their knowledge. Gender aspects of gamification, very specific. Okay, so thank you for your contributions and answers, which give us a deeper understanding of today's audience. And we will consider your inputs uh, in our future webinars and your inputs for today. I'm sure our speakers will address a lot of um, the things you posted. And as you know, we will also have a questions and answers section at the end of the webinar where we can address your questions. Which brings me to the next slide, please, the agenda. We will now start with the experts' talk. I will hand over to Andre to introduce our wonderful speakers' team. And as I already said, uh, we will have 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the uh, expert sessions to answer your questions and to go into a deeper discussion together. Andre. Welcome also from my side, Andre Martinuzzi, coordinator of the Living and Innovation Project and head of the Institute for Managing Sustainability. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 71 participants, we're overwhelmed. And I think we, uh, we put together quite an interesting program because we combined Minecraft, a game that you might know because when you observe your children, this is what they're doing when they lock the doors. Apps, the cool thing that every student wants to develop and then get rich because it's sold out to anyone to any of the big companies and virtual reality that seems to be the future perhaps we will after in the second lockdown even spend our holidays in virtual reality and perhaps it's better than in any kind of all-inclusive club 
So what lies ahead is, well, let's start from the very beginning. Let's look back and look forward a little bit. How did teaching start? Well, teaching started probably when we were apes because one ape showed the other one how to whatever, break a nut, nut or, or how, to, how to catch an animal. But then in old Greek times, the agora was developed. The idea that we discuss, the idea that we share ideas. And this is a picture not from 346 before Christ. I think it was drawn 200 years ago, but it showed how it looked like. One person talking, others listening. This was didactics made in ancient Greek times. Let's get, let's just switch forward 2000 years to the next picture. This is how it looked like 2000 years later. Well, not so very different. And you might see that in both cases, men. So it was the domain of men, one standing in front, showing things, talking, and others listening and discussing. Uh, on the next picture, we see how it looked like again 200 years later. This was a Nobel Prize winner. And we see women in the auditorium, yes. And we see a brilliant new technology. Uh, he was writing things. Okay, so he was not talking, he was writing. This, okay, it began in earlier times that we started writing to explain things. And this was at Harvard University in Boston, 2015. So you see that these old technologies are still quite persistent. We can still make use of them. So what technologies emerged during the last years? We had this technology. Then if we remember, we go back to our, well, to my childhood when it, this, this was an overhead projector and we were so astonished to see, oh yes, they do not, do not need to write uh, on boards. They can bring their slides, wow. And then we f fast forward uh, again, a few more years, interactive presentation with video projectors. And then the Corona crisis hit us. And this is where we're stuck right now. We sit in front of computers. We have very, very tiny little faces. We cannot read these faces. We cannot interpret these faces when we give our presentations into a camera. So this is a little bit of what we st where we stand today. And at the same time, if we just open the doors to our children, they sit in front of computers as well, but they do very different things. They play. They play games. And uh, this is, was the reason why we asked ourselves, what can we make use of out of this? This is the future generation. These are the people that will show up at our universities in a few years. And they're quite well adapted to that. So these teenagers and young adults, they spend up to two hours per day playing video games. This is the information channel. And can we transfer gaming elements into higher education teaching context? And the other, uh, technology that might hit our lecture rooms is virtual reality and augmented reality. It works. It works in gaming. It works in technical areas. How could a virtual lecture room of a smart university of the future look like? These were the questions for today. And I'm super happy that we got so many interesting experts and so many experiences on these topics today uh, with us. So let me briefly introduce you to our speakers, Bron Stuckey. She Currently, she is in Australia, although she's affiliated to Arizona State University. She's in Australia. She just uh, wrote into the chat. Uh, she doesn't know if it's early or late, so it seems to be somewhere around midnight at her place. Uh, she's educational consultant and specialist in gameplay and gamification. Uh, we have Stephen Reed. He's senior customer engagement specialist at Microsoft. So also Microsoft engages in Minecraft. Interesting. Uh, we have two guests from Switzerland, from St. Gallen University, Jacqueline Ga Ga uh, Gassabeck and Ralph Forsbach. Together they developed an app and they will uh, not just uh, show you how the app works, they will also explain the kind of backend, the basic idea why developing an app for students. And then we have Harry Bertlaken and Frank Piller from the Technical uh, University Aachen. And they are the ones with the 3D glasses. They are the ones where we're always not very sure if this is real Frank Piller or the avatar of Frank Piller. And we will get some presentations on how to use virtual reality uh, in future classrooms. So this is what is ahead. And without any further ado, we can jump into the first session, which means Bron please the floor is yours share your screen and we will we were very interested to learn from you how to gamify our lectures i'm going to be talking a little bit about game inspired learning i i do quite a lot of work 
um, these days in um, immersive environments. So that includes virtual worlds, virtual world games, um, AR, VR, uh, mixed realities, um, and looking at how we use those in teaching and learning and particularly how we use uh, them in assessment. Um, so that's a bit of background. I've worked in virtual world games now for uh, over 15 years from Second Life and uh, OpenSim through Quest Atlantis and currently doing work with Minecraft. So quick cap of that. Um, but setting the scene is more important for me in terms of what underlies what I do. And I'm really interested in games in learning as much as they can help us develop community identity presence um, and quality learning experiences. Um, so that's very much, there's a very much the tenets of what I um, work with. So um, I'm gonna pose something that I think is really interesting um, at a previous Games for Change uh, conference in New York, Nick Fortuno from uh, Parsons School of Design said, suggested that Minecraft itself was not a game, but a toy. And, you know, a lot of people were quite incensed because it seems derogatory to call this thing you work with a toy. Um, but it got everybody thinking about what are the affordances of the games and the game inspired things we do. Um, and um, in many ways, Minecraft is, uh, is, is what he was describing as a toy. So if you think of the affordances of a ball, a ball is anything the players want to make up out of it. It doesn't have a prescribed set of rules. It's played in some conventional environments, but you can invent your own game with a ball, as opposed to say football, which has conventional set of rules. That is a game. It has a, a, a defined space. So for me, in many ways, um, Minecraft is a game inspired environment. It has it, on a spectrum, it is very game-like in some parts and not in others. And um, so, yeah, that's a, an important point to make and to think about the affordances of game as you go through this. By the way, I'll be speaking about K-12 to at the moment, but having taught myself in the tertiary sector, I mean, I, there are a lot of parallels to what I'm going to talk about. So for me, um, what underlies why Minecraft was so important to learning is self-determination theory. Um, and that's the work of Ryan and Desi in, in 2000, looking at um, human motivation. And it, Minecraft really is the first game that kids brought to school and teachers paid attention for very good reasons, because they were seeing within this game, within this game inspired experience, that children were developing autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And those are key motivational factors underlying the human condition, but certainly underlying learning. And um, so if you want to lo look further into that theory, there's a, a great deal to take from it. And really good games have a strong sense of self-determination for the player. Um, so Minecraft, I see these as Minecraft's and motivational affordances, um, that it allows students to develop competence in whatever the learning is that's being developed um, and mastery of concepts and content, that they're developing a sense of autonomy because Minecraft can be developed as a wholly open space where the learners develop all of what happens. It can be a space where the teacher has uh, employed a pre-designed environment and it can be a space where the teacher designs their own environment for the students to play within or to to enact um, as part of the learning so within that the students have a lot of voice autonomy agency um, and they're designing it's very much a constructionist space um, they're no longer just consumers of somebody else's game and then there's relatedness, and that's really key in today's current times in building a relationship, not just to the curriculum, because that's important, um, but building a relationship to each other, to their teacher, and so someone, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Andre, that a, a, a relationship to the institution that you belong to, a sense of belonging, 
Um, and a lot of that can occur within a virtual or immersive environment like Minecraft. So these, this self-determination is what made Minecraft appeal to players, to children, to all the players. And it's why people in their 20s now still have this nostalgic feeling for Minecraft and pop back in and visit it, even though it's not the primary game they might play. Um, and people are not there um, just because it's a game they can play, they're there for the community they've developed over time in different servers and spaces. So then um, adding to that, I looked at the work and this is a really interesting researcher in the University of Michigan, uh, Liz Kolb, who has developed a 3E framework. And this really meshed with some work I'm doing um, with Lisa Castaneda in the United States, where we're looking at VR and virtual worlds and um, how teachers engage them in their teaching and learning. And um, she makes some very interesting points about in, in how we use the technology in relationship to our curriculum and how we use it to enhance the learning goals rather than just um, engaging with the technology. And this is what makes Minecraft appeal to educators. So it's a capacity to get the students to engage um, with concepts, with knowledge, to motivate them, to get them excited about something. But there's a word of caution there because engagement is the floor, not the ceiling. And it's very important that we don't get seduced by the game to thinking that they're engaging with the content when really they're engaging with the technology. And so um, it's a very fine point, but it's a good distinction to make. And then Liz suggests, well, we need to look further. How are we enhancing our learning goals and extending our learning goals by the use of this technology? And in this case, it's Minecraft. And so this is the bit where I found teachers have become very excited about it's um, extensible use within the curriculum. So it can fit in many places in many different ways. Uh, so for me, um, these are the immersive in affordances of Minecraft, the autonomy, competence and relatedness of self-determination theory, and then engagement enhancement and extension in curricular affordances uh, from Liz Cobb's three E's. And I think this applies when you're thinking about other learning environments. And I've been working with teachers to map um, how well these affordances are met by other games and game inspired environments that they're using. So whether that's a gamified system um, or um, a, a game that they're using or an app that they're getting the students to develop. Um, so how does this all impact in remote and hybrid learning? And here in Australia at the moment, um, I've been working with Victorian teachers um, who have been in lockdown for over 20 weeks of teaching. Um, so they're arguably some of the most experienced at remote and hybrid learning um, in the world. And this has been a fascinating experience to watch teachers take on because initially, um, as Andre said, this was a lot of newness for people to take on. Um, the, the level of newness that they had to adopt from going the end of last week, we're all in classrooms to, oh no, next week you can't come back to school, you have to teach online. Um, and it was a very abrupt line in the sand um, where the teachers moved to remote and hybrid teaching. And for some, that meant um, avoiding innovation and for others, it meant um, testing things out. Now, what we found over time, that is, as that newness became less, people have looked a further afield to how to um, solve the problems they're seeing with remote teaching. And initially, teachers tried to map the existing face-to-face -face day onto the digital day and quickly learned that wasn't going to be very appealing or very easy to do or indeed um, achievable. So, um, so that they, then they started looking around for, okay, how are we going to uh, massage our curriculum, our day to make it work in this new hybrid and um, remote learning situations? And so what we found were two very key things that came out of using Minecraft particularly, but it could be other um, 
multiplayer games or multiplayer spaces or creative spaces for students. So it could be other games like Roblox or, or other spaces that students are using. And what we found was that um, teachers were making up for the lost sociability of um, classrooms. And that's very important, that bonding of students, the relationships they have, not just with each other, but their relationship to the teacher. And their well-being was very important because often our understanding of well-being of learners is in anecdotal conversations we have with them in um, spaces where we're just um, sitting in the playground with students. And so understanding well-being had to have some more informal spaces for things to happen. So um, what we discovered out of um, all of what the students were doing was that um, this remote structure was providing some very interesting spaces. And one of the key findings was that room for students to surprise you was something. Now, that's dependent on a teacher being able to get in and play with their students, get in and be sociable with your students. Um, you know, it might have been the coffee shop somewhere in a, with an adult group. It may have been, um, you know, some informal forum in the face-to-face -face environment. But for these teachers, it was getting in and they had Freaky Friday, which was an hour where the students came in and played in a multiplayer server, no set agenda, but the teacher was able to play with them, have intimate discourse with them, talk about what's going on and listen to them talking to each other, look at their thought processes and their creativity as they were um, moving through that. So there's no room for that surprise if you don't create open spaces and creative spaces. Um, what they found also in creating um, new projects and uh, multiplayer spaces was there were new associations building between students. So students who normally might have um, associated with a certain group were mixing with other students and it was creating much stronger bonds between different groups of students in the space. And that's something we find in a lot of virtual worlds going back to when I was working with Second Life that virtuality actually brings down a lot of barriers that people might have between them in the face-to-face -face world. And then digital citizenship as a lived curriculum, um, getting students to engage in a digital world means getting students to engage in a digital world. And so being part of these virtual spaces in designing and creating and, ch and chatting and coding within them was all part and parcel of living the digital space and gave the teachers a really good chance to see who was very skilled and who needed some attention and being able to create um, specialist groups for students who might have needs, needed some further attention, some more upskilling as it were. Um, and that only came about by being in multiplayer spaces. And then the idea that sociability comes in lots of forms. It's not just hanging out and playing together. Um, indeed, one of our teachers took, um, had some difficulty sharing student work um, in, in, you know, like showing a student build of Minecraft over the Zoom session became very tedious. So he started making his own TV program and he would share back student work with some fun commentary because he was a TV, he was a blogger or TV com YouTuber um, and um, adding a lot of fun elements back into that. Now that was part and parcel of building a relationship with his students um, and maintaining that strong teacher bond with the learners, even though they couldn't be in the same physical space. And the second thing we saw that was really important was a, a shift in pedagogical um, practices that teachers began to challenge um, the pedagogies they were using um, or, or the practices within the pedagogies they were using um, because of the constraints of remote and hybrid learning. Um, so they started to look at group work differently and how could students be working in association. Now, students can, with Minecraft, don't need the teacher to create a multiplayer space. So they can be working off in a group um, as learners in a student initiated group, which is very important to understand that it's not all, it's in, in no way teacher, doesn't have to be teacher generated. Um, and so one, lots of, sorry, sorry? Ron, one more minute. Yes, I'm good. Um, so bringing context to life was really important. And one of our teachers built 
Um, the student built the beachhead at Gallipoli in Turkey where, um, where the Anzacs in the First World War landed and had to scale the cliffs. And the student said back to the teacher, um, I, I, I totally understand how daunting this experience was. Now I've built the cliffs. I can see how huge they were. I built it to scale and, and I can see how horrifying this was. Um, transformation of perennial topics, taking topics we've done for years and let's revamp them with this new immersive media. How can we bring that to life and enhance the learning goals by taking the students into spaces where they can build the environment and they can create the context. And then some blue sky thinking. Um, we've got a group of girls who are working remotely as a girls club and they're designing a girls esports competition. Um, and they've already collaborated with a school in New Zealand and will be running their first Minecraft competitions um, towards the end of this year. So that's um, some of what we've been finding um, out of this, um, out of the constraints of remote and hybrid learning, we've really had some big aha moments for our classroom teachers. And a lot of that is down to their ability to tinker experiment and trust in using technology like Minecraft. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bron. Very interesting insights, very interesting experiences. Also this element of, of, of interaction, bonding with students, co-designing a whole environment together with students, so not just delivering, it's co-creating. Very interesting. And for the next 15 minutes, we stay on the topic Minecraft, but we hand over to Stephen Raid, uh, who works as a customer engagement specialist at Microsoft and who also has a broad background in using Minecraft in teaching and learning. Stephen, it's up to you. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, it's telling me that I can't share my screen, but we'll work that out. Uh, let me just try again, share screen. There we are, let me do it now, okay. You can all see Minecraft? I'll assume that's a yes. Yes. And you see Minecraft. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. So hi, everyone. My name is Stephen. I'm based in Scotland, but I actually work globally using technology to teach everything from podcasting, animation, filmmaking, artificial intelligence, remote, uh, sorry, um, virtual reality, mixed reality, and particularly game-based learning. I've been using games as a tool for learning since the original Command and Conquer in 1996 and Tomb Raider, uh, the original Tomb Raider on the PlayStation 1. And I've used over 140 games in over 70 countries worldwide to teach, the pinnacle of which uh, was and, and still is Minecraft. Minecraft changed game-based learning and also games as a valuable and valued medium for teaching. Um, and, and so for the last, this will be my 11th year using Minecraft in, in schools to do quite literally anything you can imagine. So there's teachers, I'm sure on the call thinking, but would it do math? Like, can you do science? Can you do art? Can you do like, what can you do with it? You can do anything. And, and building on exactly what Bron talked about with the, um, the research and the theory, what I'd like to spend my time doing is just showing you some of what our children have been doing across the world with uh, Minecraft. So I've only got a short amount of time to show you a set number of worlds, but let me start with, and we talk about worlds, when we talk about children inside these learning environments, we talk about these worlds. And as you can see here, we've got everything from art to ancient Egypt, to immersive mathematics, to uh, renewable energy worlds and Lewis and Clark, uh, we've got conservation and so on, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of worlds, but um, over the last 10 years. But what I'd like to do is show you a couple, uh, a few examples of the power of Minecraft and just how deeply it can reach your curriculum from primary school through to university and beyond. And if we take uh, just, I'm gonna start with what we call our toy box curriculum. And there's a whole series of toy boxes from, um, in this case, this is Pompeii. Let's take our children back in time and not just to any time, but to a specific place. 
i.e. Pompeii in the Roman Empire, and we'll contain it within this little box. Because the great thing about Minecraft is, and remember, with Minecraft, you can create anything you want, block by block. So this is really just 3D art. It's voxelized. And actually, I'm going to talk to you later about how we use third-party tools like Google Tilt Brush to create Minecraft worlds using virtual reality. So very often we don't build this, we sketch this in 3D, then we have it placed. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But even if we wanted to do things like, and I'm just going to start with a very basic lesson, but if we start with by getting wool, green, yellow, red, uh, orange, red, purple, and blue. So what we can do is we can start by building a spectrum of colors. But then we can also say to our students, and I'm talking very young primary school students, teachers will say to me, you know, I, I, I can't build this giant world of Rome. I just want to do the colors and the color spectrum, warm and cold colors, etc. And I say to them, so do that. So let's get our children to place just their primary colors. What about their secondary colors next to them? So then we're going to do our secondary colors. What if we said to our children, uh, so we've done spectrums, we've done primary and secondary colors, we'll find another blank space and we'll get the children to do only the warm colors and then only the cold colors. And so we can now, I think green's considered a cold color, there we are. So warm versus cold, primary versus secondary. We could even do mixes. I'm just gonna find another blank space. We're using Pompeii to do colors now, um, but we could do red and orange equals no, sorry, red and yellow equals orange, or blue and yellow equals green. So this is young primary school, just colors. But we could also use this to do uh, to wool to do mathematics. So what if we took, uh, took this along here and we said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What percentage is orange? It's a real simple sum, but for children, it can be quite tricky. Let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we'll do that one and that one. It's a slightly different sum, differentiated for children. Um, the, the orange blocks are apart, but now we're doing basic but differentiated mathematics. What if we did it as a third? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And then one, two. It's exactly the same sum, but it's differentiated. And so our children then build up their knowledge of mathematics through this ability to just be able to do these sums and sketch. We can also do things like pattern making. So if I was to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and then let's just do red, 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 and red. And what I want the children to do is repeat it in a row going left to right. So then our children would repeat the pattern in a row going left to right. And they would do that a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. And before you know it, you're doing patterns. We can do symmetry, 2D and 3D shapes, tessellation and so on. We can do all kinds of uh, grid referencing. This entire city is built on a grid reference. We have down this side, we have our X axis. Along the bottom, we have a Y axis. And suddenly we have the ability to plot points. But let's go into Pompeii and see what we can do in more depth. We can explore clothing, culture, currency, language, food, and religion. We can go in here and we can press these buttons. And when we press these buttons like the emperor, we can have, uh, we can have, oh, there's a baby one, but we can have gladiators who then uh, children challenge and chal uh, children fight. We have public forums, blacksmiths. We have the Senate, religious buildings, poor quarters, bathhouses. Uh, over here, we have schools and libraries, and we can study that culture. But then that's just the historical and maybe the cultural. What about the types of food? So we can look at fermentatio and how they made bread as a social uh, system to feed the because because the Roman Empire knew that um, successful empires grow with with people who can eat. Um, but then also geography. We have the volcano. We have Mount Vesuvius in the very middle of the map, and the children can explore what that volcano was and what happened. But from a geographer's perspective, we also have a section of the volcano. 
And then from that section, we can look at how volcanoes are formed. So now we've gone from our history department to our geography department in exactly the same space. I mean, talk about remote learning. We don't even have to move from classroom to classroom. We just move from one area digitally to the next. And then inside here, we can do the chemistry mode. So if we go into the chemistry mode and we take something like the material reducer uh, and the element constructor, if we put both of those down, in the element constructor, we can take protons, neutrons and electrons and we can make elements like hydrogen. And from that, we can learn how to then make lava or magma or crude oil or rocket fuel. But if we take magma, let me just go into here and take magma, we can put it in the material reducer. And if we put magma inside the material reducer, we get 47% oxygen, 28% silicon, 3% sodium, potassium, magnesium. We can break materials down for children on a scientific chemical chemistry level. And we can start to look at that compared to, let's look at magma compared to standard stone. So if I now go in here and look at stone, we can say, what does just normal stone look like? Why is that not working? Oh, I know why, because I took the wrong stone. Uh, there we are, stone. Go into the material reducer, place a piece of stone in. And actually, in this case, we get 33% silicon. We get 67% oxygen. I'm just going to get rid of that one. Doesn't really matter. Whoops. Um, and we get, yeah, 67% oxygen. All of this is missing. What happened to the sodium and the potassium and the magnesium? That's picked up as the stones are melted over great distances and great swathes of time. And so we can start to do the chemistry of geography while we're doing history. And then we're also doing modern languages. So we can look at the Italian, but we can also look at the Latin. The root word is com, to come together. And then the branch word is community, a group of people together in unity, community. And so Bron was talking about community and how important it is to build community around games. We can use games to teach children about the roots of those words that we just take for granted. And then finally on this front, before I move to another world, we can click this button and it opens up Code Builder. And then our coding teachers can come in and they can use JavaScript to quite literally code the eruption. If I now type the word, uh, the word eruption, you'll see the ash now begins to fall from the sky. We've now got ash. This is all done inside Minecraft using JavaScript and the volcano has erupted. You'll see that the lava is now flowing and it will flow slowly down and it will destroy the city of Pompeii. So not only can we take children to a, to a place and a time, we can take them to a moment. We can take them to Mount Vesuvius' eruption or the moment that Lewis and Clark discovered uh, this, what is now the state of Seattle, or the, the killing of Steve Biko in South Africa, and look at the, the civil rights movement from, from that perspective, and so on. Um, and so we can code and build and live inside these spaces and teach economy and culture and clothing and textures and patterns and mathematics and so on. Um, I also want to take you to now, that was lots of different subjects inside one world. What if we wanted to focus on something quite literally one subject? And actually, in this case, a very difficult subject to teach with Minecraft. This was actually a challenge from a teacher who said to me, and quite rightly said to me, I want to teach art and I don't think you can do it. I challenge you to show me how to do it. And so what we did was we built an art gallery. I said, of course we can. So we built this art gallery and inside the art gallery, the children can go to three separate places. They can explore the masters where we're able to look at paintings like Mona Lisa or uh, the, the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci and they can explore the masters. But when they're finished there, they can go inside a one to 17,000 scale replica of the Sistine Chapel, and then we can have them paint the ceiling. And these are the exact frescoes on that wall. They're made of blocks. And art, art teachers quite often say to me, you can't make such, you know, huge, great art out of blocks. Yes, you can. We can replicate the Sistine Chapel and have the children do the ceiling for, for Michelangelo. And we can have them meet Michelangelo. Down here is the man himself. 
Ciao, I'm Michelangelo, an Italian artist living during the Renaissance, and he can talk to us and guide us and take us through this. But then we can also go along and say, well, actually, what happens if we go inside? Uh, what if we meet P.A. Mondrian, a Dutch abstract artist who did paintings like this? And not only can we look at his paintings, but we could go inside one of his paintings. And then once we're inside, we can then paint our own. Let's get real canvas, real paint, and let's choose a view. Let's go here and say that this is my Mondrian and this is someone else's Mondrian. And See this them? is someone else's Mondrian, yes. One more minute, please. Excellent. And so I'll just finish this uh, with this world showing um, if we head through to the last gallery, gallery two, we can go in to meet Claude Monet. And Claude Monet from France, who then says, this is my self-portrait, and this is the San Giorgio, uh, San Giorgio Maggiore at dusk, etc. And then as we go out of this gallery, it turns out that this entire time, we were just the size of a fly in a model museum on the floor of Claude Monet's actual studio. This is a model of, his, of one of his studios in Paris. And so we can go and explore his actual paintings. This is a Manny, not a Moni. There's a wedding ring and flowers and letters, and we can explore his life. The P.A. Mondrian was just inside the cupboard. The Sistine Chapel was just inside the wardrobe. And we can immerse children in maths and science and art and literacy. We can take our children anywhere in time and anywhere in, uh, in, in the world or, or, or in, in any other fantastical world and we can teach them. And either we can do that or we can have them do that for themselves. So I, I, I'm out of time. There's a thousand worlds I would love to show you, but trust me, Minecraft is one of the most incredible tools. And my final note will be that the, this particular room was made using Google Tilt Brush. We made the whole thing in Google Tilt Brush. We exported it as an OBJ and then we put it into Minecraft and then we decorated it with the paintings and the, uh, and the rugs and things. So we can cross pollinate those technologies. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, if you have any questions, write them into the group chat. We will come back to these questions at the end uh, of the webinar today. There was one question already that's very impressive, but what about time? How many ages does it take to prepare something like that? So this question goes to Stephen, but keep it. We will come back to this question after sure. our other two presentations. I think it's also a question to all of you. Um, how much does it take to prepare a Minecraft world? How much time does it take to prepare an app? How much time does it take to prepare a 3D augmented or virtual reality environment? Because I think that's one of the big concerns. It looks very, very nice, but mm. perhaps it takes ages to prepare it. So we'll come back to this question in our final discussion. So this leads us over to our next group. This will be a double act by Jacqueline Gasserbeck and Ralf Forsbach. And they will tell us more about a project they implemented at University of St. Gallen. They created an app. All right, um, let me share our screen. Going to work right now. All right. All right. I guess you can see our screen now. Is that correct? Awesome. So welcome, my name is um, Jacqueline Gasserbeck. I'm the head of the Teaching in Innovation Lab at University of St. Gallen, and I really love to dance. And my name is Ralph, um, really nice um, being here and talking to you. And uh, together with a friend, we've developed this application we will talk about, and, and I take every occasion I can to search. But this today is not about us, so um, please, please meet Brian. This is all about Brian. To this day, the legend of Brian circulates at University of St. Gallen. Brian was one of the best students the university and the world ever saw. No course was too difficult, no textbooks too thick, and no exam too complex. After his studies, Brian traveled the world. He worked for consultancies, international organization, and various NGOs. 
He founded countless companies, established three large families, made a fortune and reached spiritual enlightenment. And finally, after a life full of happiness and success, he retired on a small island in the South Seas. But one day, as an aging Brian sat and watched the fishermen feeding the scraps to the dolphins at dusk, he had a revelation. Something was missing in his life to feel truly fulfilled. His extensive knowledge, his experience, his wisdom, his lessons learned had to be shared. Without further ado, Brian decided to donate the majority of his brain. Under strict supervision, it was cut into pieces, packed and shipped to his beloved alma mater, the University of St. Gallen. Brian only kept his brain stem to sip coconuts and bodyboard. Ever since, the learning at the University of St. Gallen has become more efficient and effective. In addition to boring lectures, distracting study groups and stints to the library, the university now offers to a distinguished group of students, our freshmen, access to Brian's famous brain. How is this supposed to work? Nothing as easy as that. In close collaboration with countless institutes and the new School of Medicine at the University of St. Gallen, the most revolutionary technology, also known as Human Shrinking Generator, HSG, was created. This technology allows all students to shrink to the size of a microbe to enter Brian's brain and access his hidden knowledge. Unbelievable. No, it's actually true. Well, we would like to ask you right now. So you just dived into the narrative of Brian. It would be great if you could write your thoughts just in the next 30 seconds within the chat box and uh, let us know what this what impact that story had on you. Because Brian, uh, I'll, I'll wait 10 more seconds, waiting for the input. Maybe you want to, to share the slides now so you can nice. skip them. Oh, no, you, you, you just keep okay. going. That's fine for me. We do that as a team. Very cool. That sounds good. So Brian, what is Brian? Brian is an application. It's a smartphone application that's on, on the App Store and on Google Play, which allows the students to prepare them for the exam. Next slide, please. Yeah, and the question was, why do we engage in an app at the University of St. Gallen? Um, of course, we do have a learning management system. We have traditional flashcards, often provided by competitors. Um, but we wanted to do something new, something cool. But of course, it also had a serious background for us. So we wanted to give the professors more feedback on what is actually um, achieved during the class, what do the students actually know after my class? So with polls within the games or with the analytics after the students uh, went through the questions, a professor understands better what actually works in his class and what is not working. So it was also <laughs> To be honest, it was also our goal to get rid of all these private competitors that, that actually rip off our students in the first year. So we wanted to provide a free, fun experience. And of course, for me, as the head of the Teaching Innovation Lab, I was all excited about working with Sense because Sense is a very creative, young, actually high school startup who um, does really great stuff. And we were very convinced that they would kind of come up with a great solution. Let's now focus on the student side. All right, because for the student, it's not just important for the HSG, no, moreover, it's really important for the students. 
Um, learning, we believe, has to make fun. If there's no fun in learning, people do learn because they have to, but not because they want to. So first of all, students have to have fun. It has to be a social event. So we've implemented a multiplayer, but you will see this in a second. Um, so they're not alone, like sitting at home during COVID. Um, no, it has to be social as well. But moreover, we are in higher education. So there's a lot of content students need to learn. So it has to be efficient. But moreover, you have to learn the right things. So it has to be effective as well. So for now, just focus on the fun part. What is about the gamification methods will be implemented in the game. So you see a couple of screenshots. So first of all, storytelling. I mean, we let you dive into the story right in the beginning. So the students, they can also scroll through. They have a nice clean, lean text they can read. Um, and there's the same illustration. So it has to be like some sort of story where the students get involved. Then, of course, you get points. Classic um, game-based uh, method is, is to collect points once you answer quest, uh, question correct. And then, uh, moreover, you have a leaderboard in which you can climb up as a social part. Then a multiplayer, um, more in terms of social. We have um, ELO ratings, like in chess leaderships, where you, if you challenge somebody who's higher than you, um, you get even more points and so on. So even here, we have a social, social gamification element where, um, where people hopefully challenge their friends. But moreover, we also have mini games. And here I would like to, to stop for another 30 seconds. We want to implement mini games, which enhance the learning experience, but also the efficiency, not just a game for fun, but also a game which really enhances the experience and the efficiency. So what do you think? What sort of game could enhance the experience and learning? Be creative, write it in the chat. Yes, please. Ralph is eager to know. He's still looking for fun games. And indeed, we haven't, um, so we're still, we're still developing. I mean, uh, it's, it's an ongoing project. And as you can see here, the mini games, we, we've thought about some mini games. We have some ideas in mind, but we don't want to prime you so much. So uh, it would be great to hear about your ideas because we can still shift around a little bit what we're doing. But of course, it's not just fun. Let's move on. Right, flashcards. So our questions are actually based on flashcards and the logic behind is spaced repetition. Um, spaced repetition is um, a method in which every question we, we put in different kind of boxes. So you see here on the right-hand side is the success levels. So if a question has never appeared before, it's a new question. One, if you have it wrong, it comes into the category wrong. One's correct once, two in a row, and three, it's a hat trick. So um, questions will reappear. Next slide, please. And the logic is you can move up. So if you have a new question, as you start below, you move up, you get a point. Two, one's correct, two in a row, and then it's a hat trick. Now, of course, if you're wrong, you fall all the way back down. And next one, please. And now here's, here's the clue about it. There's a freeze period. So new questions. Um, so every training set consists of 20 questions. And if you have a new question, and it's only the first time you play, you have like 20 questions at the same time you've never seen before. And then every time you play again, we give you at least five new questions. And, and depending on what you answered before, um, the question will reappear. For example, if you have the question correct once, it won't reappear for at least seven hours, so it's blocked. Um, if you have it to correct twice, it's, it's one day, and then three times, it's five days. And what's the logic behind? The strength of memory. Um, if you have it wrong, you probably need to repeat it quite fast again, right? And if you have it correct once, you have more time, you rather focus on the ones you have wrong or if you've never seen. Um, twice and three times and so on. So the longer time you have, uh, the longer, the more often you have a card correct, and the longer it won't reappear because your strength of memory increases each time that you move up in the box. So time for a question again. Um, the logic of flashcards. I mean, it's an old logic, which we've chosen here um, for our method as a, as a, as a yeah, as, as, as a game method for, for, for learning. What do you think? Is this ingenious or is it outdated? Again, 30 seconds. We're really curious about this. 
and you can be critical as well. So it could also be outdated. Checking the time. Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. That's good. Um, to the content. So um, the content is created by the University of St. Gallen. And of course, it's the foundation. So if the content is not good, you won't learn anything, first of all. Um, but how do we, what kind of methods or, or, or question options does the professor of the university have? So we have um, more than 11 question types. So it can be as simple as a single choice question where one answer is correct. It could be a multiple choice where you can choose no question or all questions as correct. Um, then um, as Jacqueline said before, we have an open poll. So if the teacher wants to know, well, what do you think about this? Maybe a social question or an AI question. What would you rather do an autonom autonomous car if they're like children or grandmother? basic question then you teacher uh, students can can write the answer in, in free text so they can see what other students think then we have also co crosswords where you have a little joystick and where you choose the right letters in order to answer um, we have drag and order we have true and false we have all the same again also with pictures or with videos so we have all sort of um, different uh, mechanics behind for the professors to choose from. But what we are also again curious about is, um, we think it's, it's really one of the most critical questions. How can we enhance the teachers to create meaningful, interesting questions which, which, uh, which keep the students hooked? So um, any thought about this? So while you're writing, I might explain something in addition to what Ralph just said. Um, at, at the moment now, the game is developed for our first year students in um, uh, economics. But the game itself can be used for any topic because it's, you just have to create content to fill up the questions and you can use it in any class. And so that, that, that's the main question for us. So how can we um, help other professors to find interesting content to use the app for their class? And I like a couple of comments. Also, why not handing over the challenge of content production to the students? I would like that one. Yeah, nice. Good input. Well, where are, we, where are we standing right now? So um, as you might have figured it right uh, out already, we've just launched Monday last week. It's one class currently, as Jacqueline said, we have right now currently only implemented the single player. The space repetition is working. We have currently six question types, but we have already more than 550 active users, which is really cool. It's one quarter of the entire um, class which is using the app on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. At least it, it's, it's even daily. Yeah, I need to check again. Well, not all of them, of course, but it's really good right now. I hope it will last more. But um, of course, we will launch updates. So um, we have, as, as I said before, we want to launch the multiplayer even still this year. Um, further statistics, which allows to see, well, how good am I doing compared to the others? We will have more question types um, and mini games. Ralston, sorry to interrupt you. We would ask you for your final statement, please. Yes, um, that's actually good. Play the app, curious, yes. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, go to right. the app store, actually grab the app and play it. This was us, this was me, Jacqueline and Ralph. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to both of you. Very impressive application and it seems to be quite open to add more and more and more uh, content and more questions. Um, if you have any more questions to Jacqueline and Ralph, please write it into the Zoom chat. Barbara will put them together for our question and answer session at the very end. Uh, but before going to the question and answer session, we have one more presentation and this is from uh, our two friends from uh, Aachen, Heribert Nacken and Frank Piller. And now it's all about avatars and 3D environments. Okay, thank you for handing the stage over to us. 
both of us, Frank and myself. Um, we would like to show you something in a short video. And if, if uh, I can please see this uh, short video, it's going to take like two minutes and 30 seconds. And we, we can show you the basic idea of um, the so-called MyScore project. That is something that is funded by our National uh, Science Foundation, just by the way. And the basic idea of that is uh, that each and every lecturer, wherever he or she is going to be situated worldwide, can just make use of virtual reality. So what you're gonna see within a second, these kinds of virtual reality headsets, and then be just uh, teleported to any setting. And also the students, wherever they are situated, they can join with this lecture. What you see is our so-called conference cube. And in this conference cube, we are doing things. What you're seeing is me with a bad uh, posture uh, with my students doing some flood risk management. We started with a German company called Dupe and they set up uh, VR scenarios one year ago for us because at that time we were not able to do it by ourselves. And we tried to find out whether it suits us. And then we changed to the well-known uh, system VR chat. And with that, we start to do role play. Maybe we can elaborate on that later on. Uh, in this role play, we are going to teach our civil engineers how to communicate with John Q. Public. And by the end of this project, the software is going to be offered for the DAD, the German uh, Academic Exchange Board. And right now, since like nine months, we are working on setting up an open source software. And all the elements that you're going to see within this short video are open educational resources so that each and every one of you can make use of it free of charge. So we are uh, offering these, uh, for example, um, conference settings like our conference cube to you. We are offering this software as open source software and we're making use of it to educate uh, civil engineers whatsoever. Frank is going to mention what he's going to do within the next um, semester. So if ever you uh, would like to have the, the digital twin, like you see over here, then we are able to do it by just having seven photos done by a smartphone, phone, smartphone. And then we can set up such a cool personalized avatar like you just have seen uh, by the end of this, this video. Um, so this is just the, the pure straight ahead uh, introduction for that. And if you uh, think this is not, let's say, or this might be a good idea for you to, to try to elaborate whether it's going to fit for you students, we would love to offer this um, software to you. So that's maybe a, a quick start into virtual reality. And my dear colleague, Frank, he can add up on that. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Herbert. And let me see, I started to actually to work with avatars and because of this. So I joined this Duke company as we were um, printing humans. And the idea was that instead of having a picture of yourself, you have a 3D printed figurine. However, then we realized that everyone under the age of 25 came to us and said, do we really need this 3D printed figurine? As actually you're creating a virtual image of myself. And this is finally an avatar I could use in a gaming application that really looks like myself and not just like a fantasy thing as for some things, this may be um, a positive thing. And this is really how we entered. And I don't know if you allow me to share my screen. Um, let me see, I think I could, I can show you um, how this started. Yes, there we are. So what you could do is the first thing is we started already quite early with, um, with teaching videos. And so the video is now, you see um, myself as my in avatar. Hi, welcome to my talk. My name is Frank Piller. I'm a professor for technology and innovation management at RWTH Aachen University. This avatar was created out of a simple scan, just a simple picture actually. And it's the work of Loop, an innovative company in Düsseldorf, Germany, where I'm very happy to serve on the board and learn 
by doing so a lot about the opportunities of, of new digital technologies. This is exactly what we want to explore together in the next minutes in our lecture. But before this. And with this, obviously, you not just get good evaluations, but this is really how it started, not really as an educational resource, but in a very different background. And then we realized this is good companies. Well, you can do with the avatars a lot of things. And actually, in the current um, pandemic, first, I will come to teaching in, in 10 seconds. Um, let's let me come back to this. Um, we worked a lot with Deutsche Telekom. If they had by chance scanned 5,000 of their employees, and then when they had to go in the lockdown and if they scanned it for an advertisement campaign, they realized, well, one of our biggest challenge is to really interact deeply with our customers. As the same for us professors, one of the biggest challenges is we can't really have rich interactions with our students. And in normal times, Deutsche Telekom has like eight innovation centers, pre-sales centers, where they meet with their B2B customers to really talk. Now they could ship um, Oculus Quests to their customers and really meet in these scenarios in a much richer environment. And what previously were 150 sessions possible per year, they are already at this time at 350 sessions and customers actually like it. So this is what's happening in the commercial sector, but actually Harry Bat Nacken was really ahead of this um, in doing it um, for the university. So this may be how we teach in the future. And from my side and um, what we'll see in this scenario and perhaps Harry Bat, you can share a little bit more of what you did when you said playing around in the role plan. Teaching with avatars has two or three big um, advantages. So it's very different what we heard before with the app. For me, it's all about the richness of interaction. And we are actually in the moment developing an executive education program entirely de delivered in VR. And if you are with your Oculus Quest just in the, in the group um, doing this, you know, we are just in our project meetings. We now meet not in Zoom, but in VR. It is just so much natural to talk to each other. You have the 3D sound, you can talk to each other, you see if you are standing here or this. Secondly, students can't escape. If they have their VR Googles, they can't do anything else in parallel. But of course, this is also you really have to put in. So perhaps I stop sharing here at this point, I can show you some more later on, but perhaps Herbert, um, tell our audience what you are doing with them in this role play scenario in engineering. I think it really shows very good the advantages of the system. Okay, Frank, thank you very much. Maybe I can add on on, on uh, the things that I love with this uh, software, especially this, the, the idea is that we don't have to travel. We don't have to take, take uh, an airplane, a train or whatsoever. It doesn't need time to go places to, to meet someone. And uh, we're reducing CO2 load, sorry to say. So in this time of pandemic, where we are not allowed to go places, um, it, it's also uh, possible that, for example, our dear colleague, Professor Paganini, um, Mr. Pillar knows him very well, uh, who is at present in Austria, who is not going to be able to come to Aachen and offer his lectures. Um, he has took one of these classes with him, and, and right now he can start working with his students, his master students, in, in the winter term. So for us, it's so-called virtual mobility, mobility for lecturers, mobility for students. And for example, if I would like you to, to join up with a lecturer of mine, for example, in, in Flood was mentioned, mentioned or something like that, and I would like you to, to invite me to come over to Aachen, you would say, you're, you're a bit crazy. I have to travel. It takes time just for like 30 minutes, 90 minutes. Uh, with this software, we are able to, to connect people worldwide. And, and as for me, that's the most important thing. Besides that, being an engineer, I have to say that our engineers, they are capable of calculating, of designing things, but mostly they are not that brilliant in communicating with John Q public. But that's a, that's a thing that they have to do. They, they design things like retention basins and they are offering them to the society, but then society says, get rid of that stuff. We don't need it. So they don't have to, to uh, um, 
describe why they calculated in the right way, but they rather have to communicate. And this role play of communication that can be done in such a software, because normally I can't invite like 200 people come to my lecture just to have such a role play, but it's very easy to have like 200 uh, avatars set up by a computer and, and make three or four uh, of my students start communicating with that. Maybe just as a small add on that, because I think our time, Frank, is, is running out. Thank you. And thank you. you. Thank you very much for this appetizer. Frank, you, you would like to, audience. yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we've seen, I think, covers very different elements, but at the same time, they, it touches Just upon similar, similar things. It's about didactics. So it's about how to package the content that we want to deliver. It's about also to how, how to get the interaction, how to get the motivation done. And there are different ways of doing that. We've seen Minecraft, we have seen an app, we have seen avatars. It's about the learning environment that is immer this immersive. It's, it's incredible how big these worlds can be, much bigger than our own worlds. It's simply great. Just imagine how limited our didactics, how limited our thinking is, as we stick to two-dimensional sheets. We have Excel spread sheets. We have bookkeeping on sheets. We have project plans on sheets. Just imagine to walk through a dynamic 3D project plan. I would imagine very different project proposals to science funds and to the European Commission if we now have 3D worlds. How to go through a risk analysis and to see, oh, there is something wrong over here and something wrong over there. If it's not a list, if it's not a sheet, two-dimensional, if it's 3D. So I think we have to consider, and the other question is mostly about time. So just a brief question to all of you. How much time did it take? How much time does it take? until you can begin delivering something. Let's start with the ones we had in the very end. How much time does it take to set up such a 3D environment? So if I would say tomorrow, okay, let's do that, summer semester. How well, much time it, do I have to invest? It depends on your willingness to pay. I actually got now two um, offers by consultants that offer it really as a service, avatar-based teaching as a service. I think what we not learned with Duke is it really takes time. It's a very iterative um, process. It also depends on how much freedom you want to have. But a lot of this is, um, is, is pre-existing. You can use existing worlds. In our case, building a really realistic avatar and the software behind takes time, but you don't really have to go to this level of sof sophisticated. Think, uh, if, you can, if, uh, if you allow me to, to add on that, you can just start by using the software from this very minute. Um, if you have a, a, a good enough Wi-Fi connection and if you have a headset whatsoever, Oculus, HTC, you, you look pack it. We don't care about that. Um, and if you um, are going to use the settings that we prefabricated, and if you would like to add up your individualized avatar, which especially is the individualized hat put on a standard rig of an avatar, then it takes us around about four hours to set up. When you send us like seven pictures from you, then it takes four hours for someone who is good in Blender to set up this mesh. If you would like just to, to have a quick start, again, go there and just start playing with it. Mm -hmm. And like, like Frank said, um, okay, if, if you find it necessary to, to, to change the settings, okay, then there's no limit to that. But for example, we also started uh, doing role play with lawyers. They had the, the final exams in, in, in law done up in a standard scenario, which is just a room with some chairs and, and people and, and avatars with, with different faces. So uh, just imagine if you would like to train any kind of role play, you don't need uh, fancy 3D gadgets. So just to make it short, um, go there, use the software as it is. And, and if you would like to change it as it's open source, do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, 
also the question to our friends from St. Gallen. How, how much time did it take you to develop this app? Oh, um, Sense is super quick, so they were pretty good <laughs> about it. They had done already something slightly similar with another company. So there was some foundation there. So they didn't start from complete scratch, but they really wanted to make it unique to University of St. Gallen. So no one else had these cool paintings and the story. And, they, and of course, we also developed it together. Um, but I think, I think Ralph just sent me a short text and said, you know, it just takes more time than we thought. <laughs> well, I think it's always the same. Um, I think we started yeah, are we like... Are we talking about weeks, months, years? No, we, it, it's definitely months. Um, months. We are okay. like 10 months ago mm -hmm. um, with the concept. Also like eight, seven months ago, first testing started um, to, 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 yeah, to lock the concept. But then the programming to have at least the version we have currently right now is four months. And then we have a long pipeline. Uh, also a list of, of bugs we have to solve, of course, and I think that's totally natural, but it does take um, time. But for university, for onboarding, um, on the other side, that goes um, quite fast. They just so, need to get so, us So questions. actually, it's not a question of an individual course to take this decision. It's the question of a university to take this decision and to say we, it just pays off if you have hundreds of students or even thousands of students playing with this app. It doesn't make any sense for one individual course. It does also make sense for one individual course. Um, because we look at the course individually. So if you're like, in a, if you, because university, you know, in, in, if you study somewhere, you take different classes and maybe your neighbor you have in one class. So, but you will still want to challenge the one class and the neighbor you're sitting in, uh, you're having in that class. And you don't want to have someone who did, took the class like two years ago. So it's like one community in one classroom. Yeah. So we look at that our class individually. Mm -hmm. But of course, okay. it makes more sense, more classes you have to, mm -hmm. to get the, the app rolling. And it's mm -hmm. definitely more fun in big cohorts, because then sure. you have really this dynamic yep. going on that you're competing against each mm -hmm. other. And it could even be a kind of competing thing between different universities. Just, it just, just imagine that. So if there's a kind of similar to a sports club, if this would be the competition of the business schools of Europe with their students, Who's best? Well, I think this perfectly fits to the basic idea of competition Good. that we have embedded in our in our content. Uh, Stephen, you showed very interesting worlds, old ancient ancient Rome, uh, old ancient Roman worlds. How long does it take to build up such an environment? It must be mm. months. So that well, there's a number of answers to that, and the first is if you want to build accurately. So, for example, um, the company I worked for prior to to Microsoft we built Scotland in its entirety, one-to-one uh, -one scale, topographically accurate, and it took eight months to do. Nobody used it. And, and, and like literally nobody used it. And then what we did was we made a flat version, one to 25,000 scale, and everyone in the world wanted to use it. We had Australians using it. We had Canadians using it. And, and here's the thing. And I think this is really important um, that a lot of people, a lot of the adults, if you like, and I know that we're working with university children who are uh, university students who are young adults, but but the people who are behind these technologies, including my own company, my Minecraft, uh, Microsoft, and, and the Minecraft team, we almost need to get into the minds of the children. And what you find is they actually don't care if it's actually Pompeii. They just need it to be a model of Pompeii. You know, they, they, they what they want to know is what can I do with it. And so what we found is there's two, two answers, which I'm, I'm going to get to. One is if we're going to build it for them, let's not worry too much about making it entirely accurate. It doesn't have to be one to one scale, scale Scotland and topographically accurate. It just needs to be a one to 25,000 sliced copy or the Sistine Chapel that I showed you. The kids love that Sistine Chapel. And actually, it's really blocky and pixelated, but they love it anyway. And so we... Something like that, though, to, to give you an idea of the time scale, the, the, the art world, which was made for children, took three months. So we were able to put that together in 12 weeks. The, um, the toy box Pompeii world, we could put something like that together in about eight days, maybe, maybe seven or eight days maximum. 
Um, and that's a very small team. But here's the thing. If you make your technology accessible, because we're now dealing with second generation gamers, we're dealing with students in schools that don't want to be told what technology to use. They want to make or at least mod the technology they're given. That's why Minecraft exists, is because there's a group of gamers who said, I just want to make my own. It's why Hytale, and there's another game coming called Hytale, H-Y-T-A-T-A-L-E. Hytale is going to eat Minecraft for breakfast because it's made by Minecrafters who started playing Minecraft 10 years ago and have decided to build their own game. And so what we need to, as adults in this space creating for children, we have to be the children and, and, and ask ourselves what that looks like. And then the second part of my answer, which is real short, is have the children do it for you. If you can make your technology accessible, like Minecraft is, children will do it for you. We have children build work. We've had them do Egypt, we show them Pompeii and then we say, now we're going to do Egypt. And they're like, yay, 30 children in a classroom with Minecraft. You can have Egypt built in probably about three hours. They, like, okay. they take okay. it from eight days to three hours. Um, okay. have, have them, you know, as long as you're pedagogically sound, you're the one in control of the curriculum, you know your aims and objectives and you're able to manage those children, they will build entire curriculum worlds for you in hours. And I think Braun has similar experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Question to Braun. Uh, we heard a lot about children. Are you aware of any applications of Minecraft in university settings? And what are the specific characteristics of these kind of applications? Does it work in the same way as Stephen showed it? Might be on mute, Braun. Um, I am aware of university contacts that are being used mostly to create a sociable space or build replicas of things. Um, and they do operate in pretty much the same way. I want to, before that, I want to say, add to what Stephen said about how extensible Minecraft is. In Australia, we have a, a build of Mini Melbourne, which is um, the Melbourne CBD built on a one to one scale and is um, for an educational purposes was government built by the Department of Education and the Department of Roads and Tunnels and is used in many different educational contexts. Now that's a huge build by a professional company. They didn't ask teachers to build that. They got a professional company to build that. Um, but educators design the activities that go on within it. Um, through to, I was very concerned that teachers would ask the same question. How long does it take to build a world for my unique topic that I want to develop? And I thought people would rush to, you know, get adapt pre-designed worlds. What I'm finding is we've probably got about a third to a quarter of our teachers are tip, dipping their toes in designing their own worlds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and starting to see the idea of it, like, uh, for instance, we have a teacher who's building a particular learning world for a student who is autistic, and they've recognized some special need for this student, and the teacher and the teacher's aide and the parent are working together to build a world that will be unique for that student. So I'm re I was really surprised how, how prepared teachers were to jump in and have a go once they tasted what could be done. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's all of that. But in the university context, it's more about building the university buildings um, and, and creating sociable spaces. Um, you can get very professional with a build of Minecraft. If you just Google some of the world projects that are going on around the world. I know Sydney is being built. There's a world global project. People are building environments as part of the sustainable the UN sustainable development goals. Um, you know, really large contexts are being built. So it's more than just bolting together some bricks, as Stephen showed you, with the coding and the other elements that sit behind it. And we're talking Minecraft Education Edition. Um, you know, you have other versions of Minecraft that are more moddable and um, extensible um, to go even further. Um, so I do know of universities, um, and I could put in the chat or send you some of the examples um, at a later date. I just don't have them at hand at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
Very kind, and this is the perfect cliffhanger to what we prepared because we're a little bit running out of time now and we want to continue this discussion. Uh, we want not to stop it now. This has been the start of a discussion. We want to make use of the discussion forum that's linked to the, today's webinar. You know this uh, webinar announcement on our website um, because you registered for this webinar. And under this webinar, there is a discussion forum and we would like you you to ask your remaining open questions regarding gaming and virtual reality in this discussion forum. And Barbara will briefly show you how to do that in a moment. Um, because our speakers, our experts, said they are happy to answer all questions they receive till October 21st. So if you have more questions that were not answered today, put them into the uh, discussion forum at uh, uh, under the today's webinar and our uh, our colleagues, our friends, our speakers will answer these questions. Second thing, if you would like to attend a specialized follow-up webinar on Minecraft and or gamification and or virtual reality. So if this was the appetizer, but you want to have a much deeper dive with one or several of our experts, type it into the discussion forum. If we have a lot of requests, we will organize uh, in-depth follow-up webinar on one or several of these topics. This has been a quite rough ride over uh, three different topics. If you want to have a deeper dive, let us know. Note this into the discussion forum. And if you have any own cases where you would like to share or any other issues you would like to talk about, then put this into the discussion forum, please, as well. Not the one here, but the one over there. And Barbara will show you how to do that. Next Just slide, please. Takes a moment. You're already familiar to the Living Innovation platform, so please log into the platform. I um, posted the link again in the chat box. Uh, you can also find it on the slide here. And then um, follow the, the event link. So go back to the event where you already registered um, during the last days. And next slide, please. At the very end of the event page, you find a comment section. And please comment on the three questions in this area here. And as Andre said, our speakers will be happy to answer all your questions in detail during the next seven days. And there are two more announcements because these uh, three more announcements, there will be the next webinar on smart universities. Barbara, that's still up to you. Next slide, please. So it's uh, November 18th and the topic will be motivation and engagement. We have on board Bocconi School of Management, an Indian university, BMG Montreal University. Um, I think uh, our colleague is online today also. And we have again a University of St. Gallen, um, Switzerland, and they will share their insights. So we would be happy if you would join us again. And if you're interested in more responsible innovation related issues, not just in teaching and learning, there are two more announcements. First of all, uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, next week is the Responsible Innovation Summit, a virtual summit. And on Wednesday next week, there will be a workshop on the business case for responsible innovation. So responsible innovation is a term which has been discussed quite intensively among scientists, among uh, public policy makers, among funding authorities. But the question is, is there also a business case in responsible innovation for industry? We will discuss this at the in Responsible Innovation Summit together with a group of colleagues that represent six major EU-funded projects, and we have also one uh, innovation manager from a big IT company from Atos. There are 10 free VIP tickets still available, so if you want to attend this, please send an email to Barbara. Uh, we will put the recording in the slides of uh, our today's webinar also on our platform. If you want to know more about that, revisit our platform or send an email to Barbara. And there is one more thing coming up in uh, November, we start another series of webinars on smart home office because we experienced smart home office in the very beginning as a kind of emergency mode. Actually, I went home, put my computer on the kitchen desk and thought, okay, that's it. That's a smart home office. But now we know it will last longer than expected. We know that this will even be a game changer 
So there will be new technologies for the smart home office and there will be also leadership challenges, how to lead virtual teams in the business context, but also in the public context. These are interesting issues. We will start such a webinar, such an online dialogue with Sabina Eigner, who's a senior expert at Spencer Stewart, which is a hand hunting agency. She will talk about leadership challenges of smart home office. We have Stefan Schenach, who's a member of the Council of Europe. He will talk about artificial intelligence and the impacts on our work. And we're still looking for an AI expert because we think that artificial intelligence is an issue, especially in the context of smart home office. Because if you want to monitor if people are working, there will be some technologies that survey us while we're working. And this is also a question of responsibility, feasibility, technical aspects and desirability. So this is what we plan to do. Stay tuned on livinginnovation.net. And thank you very much for attending. And thanks to all of you who made this a very lively debate, a very interesting session. And thank you, uh, our, thanks to our experts. It has been highly inspiring. And I think we all want to know more about that. And if you want to know more about it, as I would like to more about it, take a visit livinginnovation.net, drop your line and tell us what to do. If you want to have a deeper dive, we'll do it. Thanks for attending. Thanks for being here. Have a nice evening, uh, whatever, what time it might be at your place. Nice morning, Braun. Bye. <laughs>